Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly town hall. We're so happy to have you here. We enjoy sharing our knowledge with you, and we really enjoy when you guys send in questions so that we can answer them for you and increase our knowledge when it comes to horticulture, whether it's in your lawn, in your garden, in your landscape, wherever it might be. We, we really enjoy doing this from one week to the next. We are getting down to the end of the growing season, so we are going to do this on a weekly basis through September, and then over the winter months, we'll do it once a month. So we're really excited to uh, be able to continue to do it for you after the growing season stops, because even though it's growing season stops, it doesn't mean that we don't think about our plants. And so that's why we'll go ahead and continue. So we're re very happy to have you with us. So what I'd like to do now, um, as soon as I can find my button, there it is. Um, on the screen right now is a map of uh, Missouri with all the counties and the folks uh, that are horticulture specialists out in the field who can answer your questions. So my name is Debbie Kelly. I am the horticulture specialist in Jefferson County, south of St. Louis. Other folks that are on the call with us today that will either be doing some sort of a presentation or answering our questions, we've got Katie Kamler. She's down in St. Genevieve, Justin Kay, and he's up in the St. Louis, St. Charles area. Kelly McGowan is down in the Springfield area of the state. Patrick Byers is joining us, and he's down in South Central Park. Ramon Arancibia is in the West Central part of the state. And then uh, Donna Oftenberg, Katie Camp, I'm sorry, Katie, Kathy Meacham, I apologize, and Jennifer Shooter usually join us, uh, but they have some other obligations that they have to be doing today. And so they just wanted to let you know that they will be back next week. On campus, we have some folks that are really important to the um, work that we do out in the field as well as on our town halls. So we have Dr. Pat Ganan, who's on campus. We call him Pat Ganan, the weatherman. Uh, we have Dr. Lee Miller, who is our IPM uh, coordinator that helps us to actually do what we do uh, with the town halls and also our turf specialist. And um, I believe that's all we have from campus. Um, so we're happy to be here. And what I'm going to do right now is let you know that Justin has um, changed his name to ask your questions here. So if you've got questions when someone's doing a presentation, or if you've got a total different question that you would like to have answered, why don't you go ahead and put that in the chat box, address it to ask your question here. Go ahead and put your email address in there in case we don't get to answer that question. Someone will follow up with you with an answer if we have your email. Only Justin will have that. Not, it won't go out to the full group, so you'll still have your privacy if you're, if you're concerned about that. Um, but why don't we go ahead and get started? So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to uh, Pat Ganan, and he'll start telling us about our weather and what's going on and happening in the world in Missouri. Sounds good. Thank you, Debbie, and um, good, good afternoon, everyone. Well, we're halfway through the month of September, and I thought it'd be nice just to see where we, what we've seen over the past few weeks. It's been very warm. Uh, you know, summer's not letting go, and uh, the numbers here reflect that. These are departure from normal temperatures for the first half of September, and you can see perhaps with the exception of far southeast Missouri, where they've had a little bit more cloudiness that has kept some of those temperatures uh, not getting so high. Nonetheless, the refs have stayed anywhere from about one to three degrees above normal. And so some of the drier areas actually are running hotter here right in mid-Missouri, three to four degrees above normal parts of Southwest Missouri where it's been pretty dry lately. Uh, so the first half of September is going down as a above normal one. And I really don't see these numbers changing at least over the next week or so, they're gonna stay above normal. Well, some we, we, we got some rainfall. It was uh, over the past week, and actually it was just about over the past 24 hours. That's all we've seen here in Missouri since we last visited last week. Uh, there was a cold front that moved through the state yesterday. It was more of a wind shift and um, uh, lower humidities to the north of the front. But uh, there were some storms that, that broke out uh, late yesterday afternoon and continued overnight. And uh, the winners in regard to who got the rainfall this area in southwest Missouri um, badly needed rainfall for some of these counties. It's been very dry. Unfortunately, here in mid-Missouri, we've been very dry over the past couple of months. 
we missed out on this rain event. But nonetheless, uh, you can see here in southwest Missouri and actually right around St. Louis and south of St. Louis near St. Genevieve and Perry County, they got some decent rainfall early this morning. But on the right, you can see the table showing the winners in regard to who got the most rainfall. I picked some of the highest totals from each of the counties and you can see right there in Hickory County, over three inches in this part of Southwest Missouri. Those yellows are indicative of two or more inches. So some really nice rains. Unfortunately, it was a little bit more localized. Some areas of the state missed out completely, but nonetheless, there were some areas and you can go down the list just to see some of these totals. Polk, Vernon, St. Genevieve County here in Southeast Missouri, over almost two and a half inches. Uh, the rest of these are West Central Southwestern counties, Dallas, St. Clair, Cedar, Dade, Jasper, Franklin County, just to the west of uh, the St. Louis area right here, there's actually a little thin stripe of heavier precip where some of those individuals uh, were recipients of the heavier rainfall. But overall, though, we're looking pretty dry here in the state of Missouri, especially mid-Missouri. And just I want to hit, hit home on how dry it's been. These are on the left, these are radar estimates of rainfall over the past 60 days, so over the past couple of months, starting from July 18th through this morning. Those light green areas, that's where the dryness is. That's where we, and you can see right here in Boone County, mid-Missouri, it's been very dry. And again, southwestern parts of the state, you see these lighter greens, there's some scattered areas of dryness, a little bit over here in South Central, right around Howell County, over into Southern, Southeastern Shannon County, parts of Rip, Ripley, Carter County, um, some drier conditions, but on the right shows departure from normal. And that, that really kind of shows you how far below we're, we've been running in with this accumulating this deficit over the past 60 days. These beige colors indicate generally four to six inches below normal over a, a two month period. And you, that's, you don't want to see that in the, in the heat of summer as we go towards the end of summer, but that's what we're seeing this dryness. And then uh, just to show how dry it's been, I put a table, these are actual rain gauge reports over the past 60 days. And again, much of mid-Missouri, Callaway, Boone, Gasconade, right at the regional airport. They've only had two and a little over two and a third inches of rain. Randolph County, uh, in parts of Southwest Missouri, Barry County, and just west of here in Cooper County, North Central Missouri, Macon County's only seen two and three quarters of an inch and over west of here in Marshall and Saline County. And just to, again, provide some um, context on this dry period, you know, if we look at all the, you know, Columbia has some really good records that go back to 1889. So over 130 years of solid records. And so to put this dry spell in perspective, what I did was I looked at every period of July 18th to September 15th, back to the late 1800s. And I got the top five driest periods from July 18th to September 15th. And you can see 2021, we've only had 2.36 inches here at the regional airport. Uh, that's the fifth driest on record going back 132 years. So that provides context. And it's the driest period since 1999. 1999 for this similar uh, period, July 18th to September 15th, only a little over an inch. And that ranks, you know, that's the driest in over 20 years. And we're starting to see impacts from that, from this emerging drought here in mid-Missouri. The, the lawns, unwatered lawns have stopped growing. They're turning brown. We're starting to see some leaf leaves falling from some uh, the stressed trees and shrubs. So it's something hopefully we'll see a pattern change because we need the rain and it'd be nice to get those grass greening up and getting some renewed growth as we go into the fall season, which actually starts at exactly one week from today is the first day of fall, September 22nd of next week. Currently, temperatures are looking pretty good in regard a little bit more seasonable with that cold front moving through yesterday. That's uh, This is from about 15 minutes ago. You can see temperatures across the state looking at Missouri mesonet numbers. These are temperatures generally in the mid 70s across much of the state, a little bit warmer in Southeast Missouri down in the Boot Hill. Uh, what really shows up is where that frontal boundary is. The frontal boundary is still across far southern Missouri, where we see those higher dew points, more uncomfortable conditions across the southern side of the state, but very nice conditions in regard to the heat indices. They're non-existent because of these temperatures and low dew points, generally running in the low 50s in parts of northern Missouri, generally in the upper 50s, low 60s. Very comfortable weather. I would say today is the pick day of the week in regard to these 
uh, mild temperatures and low humidities, very pleasant conditions outside currently, at least over the northern two thirds of the state. On the bottom is the week ahead uh, for, te for temperatures over the next several days. You know, we're in the middle part of September and generally average highs this time of year are in the upper 70s and lower 80s. And so this warm summer like weather is going to continue at least through the weekend with warmer conditions as we go into Thursday, Friday and into the weekend. Look at these high temperatures generally in the upper 80s, lower 90s as we get into the weekend. So very summer like conditions. The only slight outside chance that I see for precipitation is associated with the boundary on Friday that will be mostly impacting Iowa northward. So parts of Northern Missouri, slight chance of some precipitation that they might be skirted by those storms that are more forecast to impact Iowa and on North. But overall, it does look like some very, lots of sunshine over the next several days with warmer weather, as well as more humid conditions. Those dew points will be going up as we go into Thursday and Friday, and then back into the well into the 60s for Saturday and Sunday for dew point temperatures. Precipitation over the next five days, not real encouraging. Uh, we need it here in Missouri, and I just don't see it happening over the next several days as we go into the weekend. This is precipitation over the next five days. Again, that system I talked about in Iowa, up into Minnesota, perhaps bringing a quarter to a half inch, little to no precip anticipated for much of the state. Uh, there is some residual moisture in far southeastern Missouri. Uh, they might see some scattered showers today, maybe some afternoon convection as we go into the weekend. But for the most part, Missouri does look high and dry, at least over the next five days, unfortunately. Um, this is the forecast for next week. It's not really feeling fall-like as we go into the first day of fall next week. Uh, these reds here you see on the left is uh, indicative of an enhanced likelihood of above normal temperatures. That obviously that will continue, it looks like, for uh, much of next week, according to this forecast. But there are indications of a, a system perhaps impacting us by the middle part of next week. That's why we see these cooler temperatures to the northwest. Obviously, a stronger boundary extending from the northern plains into the southwest. That could trigger some more showers and thunderstorms from much of the eastern half of the country, including much of Missouri. That's why we see this enhanced likelihood of, of above normal precip for these greens. I hope this is a forecast that, verify especially, that verifies, especially when it comes to precipitation because we are so dry here in mid-Missouri. And so it does look like that perhaps we'll see an enhanced likelihood of more scattered shower or more showers and thunderstorms by uh, midweek. Hopefully that will persist and that will get us out of this drought that is emerging across parts of the Show Me State. I'm gonna transition real quickly now just to plug a, um, a, a guide of what we call the Missouri Frost Freeze Guide. It's an online product. This was a collaboration uh, between the Missouri Climate Center and the Integrated Pest Management Program. Dr. Lee Miller really was, uh, he helped push this uh, in, into happening and, and as well as Dr. Bill Wiebold, uh, Professor Emeritus here at the University of Missouri. But this is a guide that we produced a few, um, a few years ago to provide a looking at climatological data to show the, the likelihood when to anticipate spring and, free, spring and fall freezes. And so I am going to click on this. I'm hoping it works. So uh, this should take us to the uh, website. Uh, I see it on my screen. Debbie, let me know if you don't see it on yours. But this is, the, this is the link I clicked on that takes us to the online guide. Again, using uh, data from 1981 to 2010 from weather. Uh, we're, not, we're not seeing it. Oh, we're you're not, not seeing, seeing the it. Website, okay. yep. Okay. You might have to share a different screen or even back out of, uh, maybe back out and then reshare the screen that has it on there. And the link is in the chat so people can go ahead and try it on their own too. That, that could be an option. Let me see here. How about that, Lee? Got him. Does that work? Yes. Oh, excellent. Okay, so sorry about that, but this is the website that'll take you to the guide. 
Uh, and I'll go real quickly here. I don't want to take up too much time for the teleconference, but on the left is a, 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 a table or a legend where you can get the information. I'll go to median point, date point maps. We'll click on 32 degrees in the fall. Again, these are weather station using 30 years worth of data to calculate these median dates and when to anticipate that you would expect a fall, your first fall freeze. For example, here in, um, in Boone County, we have a weather station at the airport and I, I put my aerial, aer, arrow right over, it says October 23rd is the median date. That means there's a 50% chance that a temperature 32 degrees or cooler will occur after that designated date or before that date. So that's pretty much right in the middle part. Uh, you can look at all the weather stations here across the state, generally north to south, you're, you're gonna see an earlier likelihood of a first fall freeze. And you can click on various temperature thresholds for not only for the fall, but for the spring. I'll go down one more here if you wanna look at maps. This is the 32 degree temperature threshold contours for your first fall freeze of 30, 32 degrees or less. And you can see again here in the Northern Iowa, uh, Missouri border, generally the, the median date is right around October 11th. That increases to the third week of October here in mid-Missouri. There are elevation impacts from the Ozark Plateau where actually you see first fall freezes that are similar in parts of the Ozarks with what we see in Northern Missouri some urban influence here we see in around the St. Louis area. Uh, and as we go into the Southeastern lowlands of the boot hill, it, it's the, the first, the median date for the first fall freeze occurs as the late as the first week of November. So uh, extreme dates, you can look at 32 degree temperatures. And this is looking at weather stations where we have a robust history that goes back over a hundred years. And these are the earliest dates in the fall that we did see a 32 degree temperature or less. And you can see September, it, you do get freezes in September. I doubt if we're gonna see one this year, at least not for the next 10 days or so. And you can see how early these have occurred in Kirksville, 1902, September 13th, there was a temperature that reached 32 degrees or lower here in Columbia, September 18th, back in 1901. So again, it provides context when it comes to extremes, how, how early we have seen our first fall freezes across the state of Missouri. You can look at probability tables. And what's nice about this is you can actually look at, you can go to the, the your station of interest and it shows a table that shows different various um, probabilities. What we've been looking at are the 50% line, but you can look at 10% up to 90%. They're, they're pretty self-intuitive, but you have to look at them for a little bit for it to sink in. But I think it provides a lot of information on the, giving you an idea when it comes to anticipating using climatology and anticipating when our first fall freezes or last spring freezes occurs. And uh, that's pretty much a, a weather wrap up and, and a little bit of a, a information on our the frost freeze guide. Debbie, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate it. And it, it's great to see that probability guide and that is, is helpful for us to see it so that it refreshes my mind so that I know to look at that. I can help advise uh, homeowners and producers out there when they really need to be taken care of and paying attention to that weather and what, how they need to take care of all of their plants in the yard as well. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, what I'd like to do now is um, I want to give gratitude to Jarrett Bogue. He is a behind the scenes guy, doesn't come out from behind uh, the picture uh, very often. He um, is the one that does a lot of our recording, creates the snippets, um, and now we're doing the, these presentations actually live via our YouTube channel. It's M-U-I-P-M. Uh, so it stands for integrated pest management. And what I'd like to do is turn it over to Lee Miller and actually let him show you some cool things that we didn't even know about until we met this morning about the, the live streams that we've been doing. So Lee, um, let's show it to the folks so that they can go and take advantage of the great information we've been providing for them. Thank you, Debbie. And uh, again, uh, also kudos to, to Jared Fogue, um, really helps us do all of this. So we started these, these live streams uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, and, and honestly, we kind of 
we kind of feel like we missed out a little bit. We should have been doing this to begin with. And Jared has really added some great functionality to this. So, you know, if you want to see what's going on YouTube live, you can use this link. Um, won't give you the ability to ask questions like if you're in you're in the Zoom room. But uh, so I would still come to the Zoom conference, particularly if you like to see the, the questions and all of that. But if you scroll down just a little bit, so this is all the snippets. Uh, this is from Forage, and, and actually this is from all of them. But if you go into, uh, you know, you want to see individual snippets, this is where all of those are cataloged on our YouTube IPM channel. And then this is where the full videos are right below them. And what I want to point out is, is that if you go back, um, and I'm going to pause this so it doesn't talk over me. But if you go back and you have something that really was a highlight for you um, and you want to share it with your friends, your family, your neighbors, um, there are all of these links here that you can um, refer to. So if you click on the link, okay, next. it will go directly to this part of the, um, oops, I kind of messed that up already. That's live. <laughs> Um, okay. But it yes. will go directly to this, and then you can actually share this link with them, and it will go directly to this portion of the video. Um, and so you can introduce somebody to these town halls and show them what we're all about um, through doing this and, and really highlight some of the information that we're putting out, and, and you can share it with, with everyone else as well. And just in a, you know, even within the live town hall, even if it wasn't a snippet that we made, if it's a topic of interest, you can go back and actually find it. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, for explaining that. Um, and it's, it is a valuable resource. And I know we as extension specialists in the field, uh, we get lots of, of questions and having this available um, is really useful for us as specialists, but it's also extremely helpful for you as individuals who are wanting to go back. And if you're like, I remembered a couple of weeks ago, they talked about this. So you can go back to those uh, recordings and look at that and see where that particular question was that you wanted to do as a review. So you can, can uh, learn or replenish your mind, refresh your mind on what was said for that particular topic. So thank you, Lee, for sharing that with us as well. And thank you, Jared, for taking the extra time to be able to make that available for, for all of our use. Uh, what I'd like to do now is go ahead and turn this over to Kelly McGowan, who's gonna be our moderator for today. So Kelly, let's get, get jump started. All right, thank you, Debbie. Our first question today came through the registration link and it was about Granny Smith apples and some disease issues that they are having. And Katie Kamler is going to share some information about that with us. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. All right. So um, it is hard to say without um, seeing some pictures and getting some more information what disease that might possibly be. So I've got a few diseases um, that are fairly common in apples here in Missouri. Uh, so apple scab is one of those. Uh, you can see leaf spots uh, and then you can also see the spots on the apples. Uh, so depending on when scab hits, it can uh, determine how much damage it causes to the crop. Uh, the apple that's red uh, and has the spots on it, that's more cosmetic. It's not, not as big of a deal. Uh, if you're going to peel that apple and make pies, that works. Uh, however, the, the other pictures show, show scab hitting at earlier stages, and that can be pretty detrimental. Uh, fire blight. This is a common in apples and pears both. Uh, we call it a, um, shepherd's crooking. You see the entire branches that die and the tips of those branches uh, uh, crook over like a shepherd's crook. Uh, so very common. This is a bacterial disease uh, and this one can be extremely hard to control. There are not a lot of good options out there. Uh, and this is the one that I am guessing uh, the problem might most likely be, uh, cedar apple rust. Uh, so this disease has two hosts. So first it has the cedar, which is that center picture. 
And in the springtime, you may have seen some cedars that actually uh, had all of these orange jelly growths on them. And sometimes I've seen it bad enough that it looks like they're decked out for Christmas. Uh, <clears throat> They, that is the, the cedar stage, and when they're not have that jelly-like bloom, um, it's kind of a hard uh, uh, brown gall-looking uh, part that is actually fungus, and then those spores go from there to your apples, and you can see the leaf spots, and uh, if that particular variety of apple does not have resistance, it can get bad enough that they, it will defoliate a tree. It also, as you can see, has a uh, form that will get on the fruit. So you've got one of these disease problems. It is determining what the problem is, and then uh, figuring out a fungicide spray schedule in order to help prevent it. The fungicides cannot cure what has already happened. It is prevention to prevent um, further spread or um, prevent as much as we can from, from it happening to begin with. And spray schedules start early in the year and continue through harvest. Another good way to help with disease prevention is good sanitation. Uh, removing any, any uh, debris, um, whether that's pruning, whether that's fallen uh, fruit from that orchard area, uh, can also help prevent disease. And that's all I've got. Yeah, thank you, Katie. So our next topic of discussion is about cover cropping for soil health, and Justin is going to talk to us about that. All right, thanks, Kelly. Give me just a moment here. I'll get my presentation pulled up. <clears throat> All right, so always happy to talk about cover crops. This is stuff that I got to work on um, in grad school on some research projects. Um, very interesting topic. There's a lot of interest in cover crops, um, both in row crop farmers, vegetable farmers, home gardeners. Um, so I'm gonna share a little bit of information here. Um, this is a really big topic, but uh, I'm gonna try to distill down in a, a, just a couple of slides to give you an overview. So cover crops are not new. Um, although there is definitely a huge amount of renewed interest in cover crops, um, cover crops have been planted for over 3,000 years. There's records in ancient Chinese Han Dynasty texts about cover crops um, throughout the Roman Empire, uh, at different periods throughout Europe, as well as different periods throughout the United States. So um, in the 1800s, there was a renewed interest in cover crops, especially in some of the uh, tobacco production areas where the soil was really degraded very quickly. A cover crop, they're planted for a number of different reasons. And I have some up here, managed soil erosion, soil fertility, soil quality, water weeds. Um, this list could go on and on. There, there are a ton of different reasons why folks plant cover crops. Probably the most common one um, would be for erosion control over the winter time. Um, and if you look down at the bottom right, that picture is an example of a rye cover crop that was planted probably after corn harvest um, or right at harvest. And then that rye has then covered and protected the soil throughout the winter time, protected it from you know, heavy erosion events and things like that. These cover crops are generally terminated in row crop production before planting um, in the spring. And so that could be done through herbicides um, very commonly, or it could be done through tillage as well. The picture on the bottom left is just an example of some vegetable beds I worked on. Um, the bed tops are planted in tillage radish. You can see those are pretty big. And then the space between the rows is actually planted in white clover as like a perennial alley uh, plant. So cover crops affect soils in a bunch of different ways. They can help build up organic matter. Um, if we're using legume cover crops, we can help increase soil nitrogen levels these root channels that are left behind, they really help with water infiltration. A lot of times earthworms will use those channels as well. You know, there's all this cool research on the soil food web and macro and microbiology and, and the cover crop roots and the cover crop residue really feed that soil food web. 
Um, cover crops and their roots and the root exudates help the soil stick together better, help improve soil structure and aggregation. We can also use certain cover crops to pull nutrients like phosphorus from deeper in the soil profile and then deposit them higher in the soil when those cover crops break down. Flowering cover crops like buckwheat, for instance, can do a great job of bringing in some of our beneficial insects like lady beetles and parasitic wasps that can then help support pest management in the crops that we're trying to grow for food. This is just an example of a uh, tillage radish is a very common cover crop nowadays. Um, they can get really huge. They can really create some great channels in the soil. Um, and this is just an example of one of the larger ones um, that one of this, this farmer grew. Now planting cover crops. Um, this isn't something that you just wanna go into the garden and throw some seed down. Preparing the seed bed is, is really important just like when you're planting any, any other kind of crop. You can, it's important to kill all the weeds before you plant the cover crop because cover crops aren't able to kind of like overtake all the weeds. You need to have those weeds managed before you plant that seed. You can rough up the soil surface. You don't necessarily need the till. You could use like a hard rake to kind of rough it up and help uh, seed to soil contact. You can broadcast by hand. You can use a belly seeder fertilizer spreader, a bunch of different ways you can get the seed down. You could use a vegetable seeder, for instance, in a small area if you wanted to plant them in rows. That's not necessary to plant them in rows, but um, you, you want to try to cover the seed if you can. So you could use a rake to kind of just lightly cover the seed. Sometimes folks will put compost down. That can help as well. You can water after planting if you have access to a sprinkler or something, or you can just kind of time it before a rainfall event. These are just some of the examples of the different seeding equipment. You can see in the middle there, um, you know, a fertilizer spreader or seed spreader uh, push behind. There's belly seeders that are you kind of wear on the front. Um, that, that's a drop spreader in the bottom left, which is a really great tool. A couple of things you want to consider before you plant, you know, check and see whether that cover crop that you're going to plant is generally planted in the fall, spring or summer. Um, you know, consider how long it's going to take for that cover crop to mature. How's it gonna be killed? Um, some cover crops are killed by frost and low temperatures. Some cover crops like our winter annuals like rye and vetch, they actually need to be killed in the spring because they will survive the winter. You do wanna terminate them before they produce mature seed because the cover crop can become a weed in your garden. You don't wanna, you don't wanna deal with that situation. You also wanna consider what is the crop, what is the vegetable plant that you're gonna plant after the cover crop? So for instance, um, if you planted a bunch of vetch and rye, a lot of material left over in the spring, you got to kill it. There's all kinds of residue on the soil surface. You wouldn't want to do that in an area where you're going to direct seed carrots or beets because it's just going to be too much residue for you to get to the soil surface and do a good seeding. Something like tillage radish could be good though because it leaves very little residue the next year. This is a chart from Managing Cover Crops Profitably, which is a SARE publication. Um, this is free, available as a PDF. We'll drop that link in the chat box for you. Just a ton of information in this book. If you really want to geek out on cover crops, um, this is a good text to do it. Seeding rates, seeding dates, um, details each cover crop, when they're planted, what they're planted for. So if we think about our fall plantings of cover crops, most of the time they're planted mid-August mid to mid-September. Um, but they can be interseeded later into, into standing crops or bare soil. Cereal rye, for instance, can be seeded up to Thanksgiving. Um, but a couple ones to consider tillage radish, that one winter kills. Um, it provides good cover in the fall. And then when it kills, those leaves break down and it really doesn't leave a whole bunch of residue, which is nice in the spring. Oats are another common one. Um, spring oats, this is planted in the fall. Um, this will winter kill as well. That's a low residue one. Winter peas are also very common in vegetable production. That one has a side benefit of nitrogen fixation and they will winter kill as well. And then hairy vetch and rye, those are winter annuals that were, will survive. Also common cover crops, but they have some other considerations in terms of killing them. Just a couple pictures here to give you some examples. Uh, pumpkins planted in cereal rye cover crop. This is a pretty common one. Sometimes they're also planted into wheat stubble. Um, this is an example of a cereal rye vetch mixture. It was planted in the fall, terminated in the spring, and then they actually planted the tomatoes right into that cover crop. And now they have a nice mulch on the soil surface. This is an example of 
tillage radishes that were planted the year prior. You can actually see what's left of one um, in the foreground of this photograph. Um, and then there's very little weeds that come up in the spring because they shade out, um, they shade throughout the fall. So you have less weeds. And this one, they actually didn't till, they just seeded no-till spinach directly into that bed. Uh, for cover crops that you do have to kill, a lot of folks on a small scale are using tarps. Um, you'll probably need to mow them down before you put the tarp down to really kill them. Um, you can mow them with, uh, you know, if they're not too tall, you could mow them with a push mower. You could probably mow them with a riding mower. You could use a weed whacker to kill them. Um, so things like vetch and rye. Rye, you want to terminate when the seeds start to set, but before they become mature. And then vetch, you want to terminate when it flowers. So if you mow those winter annuals right at those right times, for the most part, they'll die. Um, if you mow them prior to that, you'll need to use a tarp to kill them. The sunlight will block them out and terminate them. Or you could till them in and incorporate them. And that's another way to kill them. Silage tarps, which can be found at most farm supply stores or what a lot of folks are using. And I've also seen folks using used billboard tarps that they can find um, used and very cheap. And then, you know, the bottom there is just an example of a sickle bar mower attachment that could be used, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. You can kill them with a hoe on a very small scale as well. Just a couple things to think about. Start small. You don't want to do your whole garden at once because um, this is really a different management practice. and you're, There's going to be some things you're going to need to learn all the way. If you're going to start, use easy winter kill cover crops like oats, radish, and field peas. That would be my suggestion. Check out that SARE publication. All kinds of good information in there. And, and take some notes. When did you plant? What did you plant? How many pounds per acre, 1,000 square feet? Um, it, that'll make it that much easier when you come back next year to figure out what you want to do. Um, you can learn a lot from those experiences. Um, and if you are using winter annuals like Vetri, just make sure you're going to understand how you're going to kill them and how that residue that's left behind is going to impact what you're doing. So that is all I got. All right, thanks, Justin. That's great information. Okay, our next topic for today is our insect friend or foe segment. Tamara, what do you have for us today? Hi there. So I have a little caterpillar. This is teardropped. Um, it has long, silky hairs. So I'm going to activate the poll and let you tell us whether this is a friend, foe, neither, or it depends. We just launched the poll, so you should be able to see it. If you don't, you can always put your answer in the chat. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. All right, if you haven't put it in there yet, just try and get it in there. I'm going to end the poll. And then I will share the results. Here we go. You should be able to see them. So it looks like most people have put in that this is a foe. We have a few people who said this is a friend. Some said neither, and it depends. So let me tell you what I said. So when we look at this one, I said it depends. This is an asp caterpillar. It does have some other names. If you see one of these, do not touch it. These fluffy caterpillars are called asp caterpillars because of their potent sting. And you, like I said, there are some other, other common names, um, but, and they look, they look like they are just like a cute little kitten or something. And you just wanna, you just wanna pet it. But uh, these caterpillars can feed on various trees and shrubs. So some of their favorites are oaks, elms, hackberry, maple, and sycamore. Usually there's not enough of these to even be noticed. So I'd actually say that overall, they're probably a neutral insect. However, if you happen to touch one of these on accident or because you just can't resist because they look so fluffy, you will soon understand why they're called an asp caterpillar. It can be very painful and the pain can last a few hours. You could also have symptoms such as swelling and nausea, headaches, fever, itching, uh, chest pain, difficulty breathing, numbness, and even vision problems. So what causes the pain is from these hairs. They're actually hollow spines that are filled with an urticating, urticating fluid. So if you see one of these, it's best to just leave them alone. And that's all I have. I will put a couple 
a couple links in the chat so you can get more information. Thank you, Tamara. I would be tempted to touch it, but I, I know better now, so thank you. Okay, well, next we are going to have a turf update with Dr. Lee Miller. I'm here. I'm just, let me get my screen share up here. You should all be able to see that. So this is the time to, to really be thinking about your, your yard and, and rebuilding density. So when we get to this, most of our yards in Missouri are cool season turf grasses. So that means that they grow best in spring and fall. And they, our lawns right now have gone through basically a marathon. So it, it's basically been 90 degrees, actually still is 90 degrees. Um, and there's a lot of pest pressures and, and things of that nature. So it's time to think about rebuilding it before we get into those freezing temperatures that, uh, that Pat was talking about. And one or two freezes isn't bad, but you don't want to have consistent freezes before you seed. So I use the, the adage, it's four S's, spread seed in September with sustenance. So the, what that means is go out and, and, you know, at least every two or three years, go out and just overseed your lawn just to rebuild because a, a high quality lawn is the more of our plants than the weeds. So we can out compete them by actually putting the, the seeds down that, that we want. Um, the good thing is it's organic. Um, so, you know, you don't have to use herbicides. You don't have to use any pesticides for on seed because seeds are plants. Um, and then also I want to talk about, you know, we normally look at around that September 15th as being this prime time, but we need to think about moving that a little bit and being a little bit more fluid, particularly in the weather that we're, we're having now. Um, it feels very summer-like. Um, and at least for us here in mid-Missouri, the tap has been completely turned off, the faucet. Uh, you know, we are not seeing any rain and most lawns are unirrigated. So if you're in an unirrigated lawn, we can actually kind of slide that back a week. Um, we can think about maybe seeding this weekend. Hopefully we will get some of those rains that come in next week and, and start to get into more fall time, fall like weather. Uh, this is next week's weather. This is exactly what you saw on, on Pat's presentation. Um, so you can see we're still hot. It still seems like summer. Um, and we really are in that drought, um, that drought situation here, at least for, for quite, a, quite a bit of the state. Um, and if we're not going to get that rain, timely rainfall, it's okay to seed now. The seed is just going to kind of sit there until that rain activates. And that's when we really need to think about, okay, maybe we do need to get the sprinklers on it if we're not gonna get any consistent type of rainfall. I do wanna point out, and, and this isn't mentioned very often, that our uh, particularly tall fescue um, has what's called endophytes in it. Um, and these are microscopic fungi that actually live with the plant as a seed. So it actually acquires it as a seed and lives with the plant throughout its life cycle. Um, these are very beneficial. They greatly reduce herbivore feeding. A lot of us are uh, finding out about fall armyworm this year. Um, you know, some in endophyte infected plants will have at least a little bit of resistance, not complete, um, but to other types of bugs like bill bugs and, and things of that nature. Um, it will greatly reduce the, that kind of feeding and then also increases the heat and drought tolerance. And really for us makes tall fescue, it, uh, it enhances it, its, its ability to get through the summer and to get through that, that disease time and also that heat stress time. Um, and that's going to allow you to actually reduce pesticides. So what I'm going to point out here is that you want to get fairly fresh seed. It's okay if it's a year old or maybe even a year, you know, a, a year or two old if it's been really stored properly, but you don't want to get that dusty bag that's in the back of the, you know, that, that you know might have been sitting there for a while. You want to have some, some turnover uh, with the, the, um, the market or wherever you're going to buy your seed. So um, keep that in mind so that you're keeping those endophytes kind of fresh in there and you know that you're you're planting fairly resistant seed. 
how much to spread. If you're overseeding, which is going to be most of our, uh, most of us, the recommendation is four to six pure live seed per thousand square feet. I'm going to talk about what that means here in a second. If it's a complete renovation, completely bare ground, six to eight pounds of pure live seed per thousand square feet. And I'm going to tell you, that's a lot of seed. Um, you know, I, I used to work with um, a retired superintendent of, of 40 years, and his adage was seed one, sow one, and leave one for the birds. Um, so when it comes to seed, a little bit more is, is going to be better. Now, pure live seed takes into account the germination percentage of the seed. Um, you can look at the back of the package. Every um, bag of seed that you buy should have a seed label on it. Um, and look for that seed label. That's where you're going to find the varieties. Um, you want to you want to find good varieties. And and uh, you know I've discussed that in the past. But you can also ask your uh, your extension folks in your counties. Um, but with 85% germination, which is normal, you're either going to see 85% or 90%. But at 85%, that's going to be 4.6 to almost 7 pounds per thousand square feet. Doesn't seem like that big a deal, does it? Well, if you're doing 5,000 square feet, the size of a fairly average lawn, you're going to get up to 23 to 35 pounds per, per 5,000 square feet. If you weren't going to look at that germination percentage, it would be 20 to 30 pounds. You're still thinking, ah, eh, a couple pounds here, a couple pounds there. What does it matter? When you get into a full acre, it really matters though, because you're looking at the difference between 200 to 300 pounds to 174 to 261 pounds. And you're like, you know, that still doesn't, a pound doesn't seem like it's that much. However, when you look at what actually the number of seeds, and this is what nature cares about. Nature doesn't care about how big a bag you put out or how many passes you made with your spreader. It cares about how many seeds you put out and how many plants that's gonna produce. So if you look at tall fescue, that says 500 seeds per gram. There are 454 grams per pound. So think about that and do the math and look at how many less seeds you're putting out if you're not looking at pure live seed. And I. I can almost guarantee you're going to get a better take and you're going to get better coverage if you go out and really apply uh, based off of pure live seed for your seeding. And that's all I have. Thank you very much, to, uh, Kelly. All right. Thank you. Okay. Our next topic is about summer bulbs. And I am actually going to talk about this. So let me... Pull up my presentation. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about summer bulbs. And these include things like cannas, dahlias, gladiolas, caladiums, and a few others that we're gonna talk about. Now, these are considered summer bulbs because they are typically planted in the spring after danger of frost. Or after danger of frost. So let's look at some of these. Uh, the first is cannas, and cannas can be a beautiful addition to the home landscape, not only because of the variety of flower colors, but because of the variety of variegation and color of the leaves as well. They can also come in a variety of heights and just really look beautiful. And these are grown from rhizomes, and you can see a picture here of what those rhizomes look like. The next is dahlias, and I want to thank Patrick Byers for the photos in this presentation. Um, dahlias are a beautiful summer bulb. Actually, they're considered a tuberous root, and you can see here what that tuberous root looks like. These here at the Springfield Botanical Gardens are in bloom right now and just really looking beautiful in all kinds of different colors. Gladiolas. Gladiolas are grown from corms, C-O-R-M, and you can see here a picture of what that looks like, and they produce little baby corms as they age, and new plants can be started from those as well. 
and caladiums. Caladiums are grown from tubers. You can see a photo of that here. A beautiful addition to the landscape. Again, the foliage comes in a variety of colors and patterns and um, does looks well in shady areas. Tuberous begonias are a popular summer corm that's planted in many yards and there's different types of tuberous begonias. And one of my favorites, elephant ears. And you can see here the, the big tubers that they grow from and um, very easy to find in lots of different stores. And there's lots of different types of elephant ears. There's the green kind of classic ones you see here on the left. There's black colors, there's Thai elephant ears. So um, again, one of my favorites. And if you've never grown these before, I just really encourage you to give them a try. They're a lot of fun to grow. So one of my new favorites this year is Clivia. And Clivia, as you can see here, the beautiful flowers, um, it kind of looks like a lily flower, but they're actually related to amaryllis. And Clivias can do well in the summer outdoors, but they can also be brought indoors as a house plant as we get into fall and winter. Um, bright indirect light is what they prefer indoors and then in the summer they can do well in kind of a dappled light situation outdoors. But this is just something that I've really fallen in love with the last couple of years and I'll show you a couple of photos here. The one on the left is a little baby plant that I've been nursing for about two years. It just hasn't done much of anything, never bloomed. Um, but I'm not giving up on it. I'm, I'm still keeping it around and hope, hopefully it'll do something. This one here on the right, um, I had stopped at a, a lady was having a plant sale in her front yard just a couple of weeks ago, drove by it on my way to work, decided to pull in there and see what she had. And she had these huge clivia plants that she was dividing and selling. And I was able to pick this big one up for about five bucks. So I was really excited about that. Um, really, they don't need a lot of special care, but they generally don't survive our winters. So they'll need to be dug and stored before we get into colder weather. So the things that we just talked about Sometimes they will survive our winters, especially if they're in a protected area, but to be on the safe side, it is best to dig them up before we get into freezing weather. Now to dig those up, you just want to do it carefully with a pitchfork or a shovel. You want to make sure that they're well dried out. You don't necessarily want to wash them because they store best when they're dry. If they're wet when they go into storage, that can lead to rot and other problems. So make sure that they're, they're dried out. Um, you can store them in peat moss or vermiculite. Um, we have here some, some bulbs stored in onion bags and kind of hung to store for the winter. And as far as storage, you wanna store them in an area that's about 45 to 60 degrees. A garage works well, an old barn works well, as long as they're not exposed to the elements and they um, will typically do pretty well. You want to check them periodically throughout the winter, make sure that they're not getting any moisture, that they're not being, um, that mice or insects aren't feeding on them. And for the most part, they're going to survive the winter in storage and then you can bring them out next spring after danger of frost and plant them all over again. Okay. okay, so with that, the next thing that we're gonna talk about is fall bulbs. And Patrick, what do you have for us? Okay, uh, Kelly, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so we'll continue to the discussion of bulbs with uh, uh, managing hardy bulbs. And it's such an interesting, exciting, diverse group of plants. It's no wonder that uh, people get excited about bulbs. And the, uh, the fall time of the year is a great time to consider planting these hardy bulbs and then making an investment in the future. Many of these bulbs will perform for, for decades after you plant them. 
So just quickly, uh, a true bulb, a, a hardy bulb, such as a, a uh, daffodil, typically planted in the fall. The reason that they're planted in the fall is that many of these bulbs require a period of time for the, uh, the bulb to establish a root system and to develop the, uh, the uh, uh, flower inside the bulb. And if you look at that upper picture, you can see a hyacinth bulb that's been split lengthwise, and you can see the uh, primordia for the flower within that bulb. In that primordia requires cool temperatures to develop during the winter so that you, you will have a nice display in the spring when it begins to flower. And typically somewhere around uh, 12 weeks or so of uh, cool temperatures are required. And that's why we typically plant these bulbs in the fall. They'll then uh, sprout in the spring, they'll, they'll blossom. At some point the foliage dies back and then they, they go dormant again. Now, just a quick note, always a lot of discussion about what to do with the foliage of hardy bulbs after they're finished flowering. Well, you don't wanna remove it. It needs to be maintained as long as it's green, healthy and photosynthesizing because it's storing strength for uh, the support of that flower uh, during the next cycle. So in other words, those daffodil leaves that remain after flowering uh, in the uh, spring and summer need to be maintained so that they can help build strength in the bulb so you have a nice display in those daffodils the following spring. Now, the hardy spring summer bulbs, um, it's, it's a very diverse group, lots of lovely, lovely flowers for the garden, but certainly tulips, narcissus, hyacinths, various types of alliums, crocus, and a number of other smaller spring flowering bulbs and lilies are all commonly planted in the fall. I do want to mention some hardy summer and fall flowering bulbs. These include Lycoris colchicum, fall flowering crocus, and then the Eastern Burgi, which is that yellow flower there in the middle. These bulbs flower later in the summer or even into the fall. And frequently with these types of bulbs, they, they can be fall planted, but frequently with these types of bulbs, your goal is to catch the period of time between their production of foliage, which is in the spring and summer, and when they flower, which is in the summer and fall. And so these may need to be planted earlier in the fall than a more typical hardy uh, spring flowering bulb. So choose a good site for your hardy bulbs. A good site is, is, is a well-drained. And uh, keep in mind that you can plant these bulbs under trees, even in areas that will be shady during the summer, because many of them uh, develop their foliage before the canopy of deciduous trees closes in over them. So they're able to utilize sunlight even in areas that will be shaded later. Best time to plant uh, these bulbs is in the fall, September to November, good time to, to target, and always buy good quality bulbs. And in general, this equates to size. Larger bulbs will give a better display in the first flowering season after planting and oftentimes perform better over the life of those bulbs. But you can buy smaller ones, especially if you're buying in quantity and you're going to be naturalizing these where you, you need a large number of bulbs. Digging the hole. Uh, you can certainly use a bulb planter. Um, in Southwest Missouri, where we have to contend with rocks, oftentimes it's a better option to use a spade or a trowel. I've heard of gardeners using a drill with a bit that has about a two inch diameter to open holes. But again, that would really only be practical in a soil that didn't have a lot of rocks. And, and I've also heard about gardeners protecting their bulbs, particularly valuable bulbs from rodents. Uh, rodents such as uh, pocket gophers and other uh, soil living rodents can feed on bulbs. And it can be disheartening to plant the bulbs and then discover that they were devoured during the winter uh, uh, before the, uh, the next flowering season in the spring. Rule of thumb, plant your bulbs about two to th three times as deep as the bulb is high. And you can see this diagram shows the uh, different planting depths for bulbs. The daffodils tend to be the most deeply planted bulbs and the others, of course, more shallowly based upon the, uh, the uh, diameter of the bulb. And always make sure that you plant the bulb in the proper orientation. Generally, the pointy end points up. There are a few bulbs that are a little bit tricky. They don't particularly have pointy ends. So be, be again, aware of wh where the growing point is and where the basal plate, where the roots are going to develop and plant the bulbs accordingly. Uh, it's helpful to supplement fertility at planting. And there's two approaches. One is to use a sulfur-coated, slow-release, complete fertilizer. And this can be placed in the planting hole and mixed into the soil at the base of the planting hole at a rate of one rounded tablespoon per square foot. And uh, the second system is to use bone meal. And again, it's a similar approach where you place one rounded teaspoon of bone meal per plant, or, I'm sorry, one tablespoon per uh, square foot, or uh, depending on the analysis of your bone meal, if it's more potent, one rounded teaspoon per square foot, 
and then mix that in to the, uh, the hole at the base of the bulbs. There is an excellent guide to, uh, to uh, uh, growing daffodils, which has some information that is applicable to most of the hardy spring flowering bulbs. And I believe that that link has been dropped into the chat. And uh, again, just to reinforce that there are horticulture specialists across Missouri. If you have any questions related to fall planting of bulbs, reach out to your local horticulture field specialist. And that's what I have. All right, thank you, Patrick. Okay, well, I'm gonna turn it back over to Debbie to close us out for today. Yeah, thank you, Kelly, appreciate that. So what I have up on the screen again is our the map of our state with all the folks that can answer questions for you. If you come up with a question uh, throughout the week and you don't wanna wait for a full week, um, that sounds perfectly fine. Email one of us. If you notice that there is your county, it says that it's open. Don't worry about that. We're in the process of starting to refill some of those positions and it will take a little bit of time before they get filled. Uh, but email any one of us. All of us are happy to answer those questions for you. Uh, we do wanna let you know that um, the live stream and the snippets and Lee talked about that a little bit earlier and how you can go back to the, the previous, uh, down here you can see the, the, the live sessions that we've done and you can go back and look at some of those just to see what some of those topics are that might be of interest for you. We are gonna let you know that we will have two more weekly town halls. Then starting in October, we will only meet once a month. Uh, we will make sure that we email out to you ahead of time. We're not, we don't know which Wednesday of the month, we're gonna talk about that. Uh, and we'll let you all know next week, which Wednesday of the month we will do this. And then again, once the growing season starts next year, we'll go ahead and, and get that jump started and start doing those again on a weekly basis. What I'd like to know is we do have one question that came in on the chat box um, and Justin's computer locked up. And so I don't know for sure. I will go ahead and stay on for a few extra minutes. If the person who asked the question about Bardot fertility or mixture, I forgot which it was. If you wanna just um, send me yep. your email address and we can get that answered for you. Uh, Debbie, actually, if, if that person wants to stay on, Justin communicated with me about that question. I'm happy to answer that. Okay, that sounds good. In the meantime, we'd like to say thank you very much for joining us. We hope that you'll be back with us next week. Go ahead. And if you've got a question, email us or fill out the, the town hall right here with your question, and we'll be happy to answer that. Otherwise, have a great week, and we'll see you next week, Wednesday. Okay, uh, Jay White, if you are still on, uh, your question about Bordeaux mixture and fire blight, yes, indeed. Uh, Bordeaux mixture is helpful against fire blight. Uh, you, you do have to mix it up at the proper recipe and, and you send a recipe. I, I don't know right offhand if that's a, uh, an effective recipe against fire blight, but I did drop a link into the chat uh, on a publication from Oregon State that has some recipes for Bordeaux that have worked against fire blight. And just a couple of, of comments, make sure that, that Bordeaux is used uh, just you know, before there's any green tissue present. In fact, it's best used uh, at or before um, bud swell on apples and pears. Um, otherwise, if you use it too late and there, particularly if there's green tissue present, the Bordeaux mixture will, will severely damage any green tissue. So it needs to be used early in the season. And uh, there, there is a precaution on the label about mixing it with uh, with our mixing copper sulfate with oil, typically Bordeaux mixture is uh, formulated with uh, uh, slick and lime to help make it safer from that aspect. So Bordeaux mixture can be mixed with oil uh, as can the other uh, uh, fixed copper sprays. Uh, but you know, be a little bit cautious, particularly if you're using a uh, recipe that doesn't have a reasonable amount of slick and lime in the, uh, in the uh, blend. But yes, Bordeaux mixture can be helpful in managing fire blight on, on apple trees. All righty. Thank you again for joining us and we will see you all next week.